I'm Robert Court, and the background to this presentation is really support questions we've been asked over the years. There are simple questions and answers in the worked examples, but this is some some of the background of why do I do this, how do I do this, etc. So I hope it proves useful. Some of the background, most of this is from the ENCODE product side, which is Design Life in particular for FE, but uh, you may be familiar with Reliasoft and come to us from that angle. On the uh, ENCODE side, we, we bridge the gap between test and analysis, and you'll see for vibration it's particularly useful. Um, we offer training courses, and we even do some of the work occasionally ourselves as services, uh, in particular the materials testing. So here's the agenda. Um, I've got a video to sort of start off with an introduction, and then we're going to go through quasi-static FE and time-varying loads, because it looks dynamic, but it's not. Then we move to modal testing and frequency response, which is the unforced side of things. And then the, finally, the forced side, transient loading and frequency domain, and questions at the end. So the simple question is, why do we care about dynamics and fatigue? Because a lot of structural calcs are static. And to show you that one, I'll answer that, I put a video, which hopefully will start at the right moment. It's a famous case called Tacoma Narrows. It's a, Tacoma Narrows is a place in the US, and it's a suspension bridge. And the underside of the bridge deck was unfortunate enough to cause aerodynamic vortex shedding. So this is drag basically that releases from time to time and triggers vibration. As you can see, that's not good for the bridge. So it's basically it's triggered a natural frequency in the bridge. If I advance it a little bit. You can see it's quite severe. There's a car on there, it's still staying stuck to the ground, but this is getting more and more severe under wind, high wind conditions. And there it fell down, the inevitable happened. So that's why vibrations and fatigue are important. Do you think we'd, with modern bridge design, we'd understand things better and do a bit better? This is the London Millennium Bridge. It's a footbridge, and as you can see, the picture's quite a nice one. It's a very flat suspension bridge for design reasons, just to make it look aesthetically pleasing. The suspension cables are off to one side, and it gives it a rather different vibration feel. In particular, what happens is the, the bridge wobbles laterally underneath as though you're on an earthquake zone, and the pedestrians can feel it. And the pedestrians react, and they react by stepping. Sorry about the commentary. They react by stepping sideways, and as they all step in sideways to, to save themselves from falling over, the bridge starts to accelerate more and more, so the pedestrians are making the bridge wobble. It got fixed by putting mass dampers into it. So that's the background. That's why vibration matters and fatigue. And here's the simple equation that governs our lives. Mass times acceleration, velocity times damping, more of that later, and stiffness times uh, displacement. And for the minute, we'll say equals zero, because we're not talking about forcing. We're interested in the modal side of things. So we start with quasi-static. You may have seen this little flow chart before. Uh, that's the dynamics loading side we're going to come to. But we're interested in quasi-static loads, which can be constant amplitude. Block, block cycles, or time series. I've added the time series one because it's one we forget. We're quite used to the idea that we take structural measurements and simplify them to constant amplitude or block, block, block loading. Time series looks like it has frequency content, and indeed it does, but we're not using it. Most of the time in design life and in its predecessors, we're using quasi-static loads. They, they vary with time, but there's no dynamic effects. I can say that with confidence because the models themselves, the FE model is a linear static model. So how do we cope with those? This is a quick glimpse of the typical input to design life. You have an FE model with unit load cases. In this case, it's got X, Y, and Z loads at one location near the shock tower. There are unit load cases, X, Y, and Z. And if you multiply these together and superimpose them, you get local stress response. Question is, are they dynamic? 
And the short answer is that most cases, a huge proportion of the people's work is still quasi-static because structures that are load-bearing tend not to be flexible for obvious reasons. Um, but increasingly, people are doing dynamics, and that depends on what the problem is and how, how much effort and time they've got to put into it. But the key thing it depends on is the frequency content. Does the frequency content of this loading signal coincide with the natural frequency of the structure, as we saw with the bridge? Out of deference to our colleagues who work on multi-body dynamics, it's worth pointing out that in, in those cases, damp is a rate dependent. So yes, there is a time d d element to it, and it matters. But it's not a frequency so much as if you damp, hit, hit the damper fast, faster, you get bigger forces. So it's all down to the engineers who make simplifying assumptions. But historically, and, and still to this day, we see lots of people running quasi-static models and getting useful results. If you zoom in on the loading a bit, you can see there's definitely frequency content. There's little cycles, big cycles. Some of these happen over a short period of time. Some are even shorter. And the peak loads are not necessarily coinciding. So there's a lot of phase relationships as well. How do we do it? For each load case, we take a unit load case, let's say vertical, and we measure vertical load versus time. And we scale those together. Because it's linear elastic, we can use superposition. And we scale load case one, two, three, et cetera. Um, each of them has its own frequency content. But because this is a quasi-static one, we, we don't care what the frequency is. We just combine the results together and get the local stress. So the local stress comes out of the FE model at every, every node or every element. We do a rainflow cycle count, which, if it's elastic plastic, has a hysteresis loop. Um, we then, for display purposes, rainflow count it into a rainflow matrix. This, this is lots of, at this end, we have lots of little cycles doing very little damage. At this end, we have a few big cycles doing most of the damage and a mean axis. We take each of those cycles, we look it up on a fatigue curve, an SN curve, strain life curve, and look at how many cycles it could have, and therefore what proportion of damage it was uh, as consumed. So this is a, a matrix on the same scale as the rainflow matrix. This is the damage matrix. And as you can see, this cycles below the threshold, which don't matter because they're not doing any damage. Some which do a little bit, and a few which dominate. And for each cycle, we take calculate the damage and then sum the damage using minus summation. And that basic process is the same for quasi-static and dynamic. In general, we used to use histograms for speed. These days, we don't. We don't need to. But they're still there for pictorial purposes. So that's the background, and we're going to now impose some dynamics onto it. People sometimes ask the question, what is it? What is free, free, et cetera? So I thought I'd start with some definitions. The natural frequency is the property of a structure, and it tends to oscillate at that frequency. If you give it a little tap and then leave it without it being forced continuously, it will ring at a certain frequency or frequencies. Some of the terms people use are free, free or free fixed. I think there's a picture there. OK. So if we take the case of a bell, if you tug on the rope gently, you, the clapper hits the bell, and then you let go. So you're not forcing it continuously. You just set it in motion. And that's a free, free analysis, because if you look, it's suspended by bolts and straps. It's not clamped down in any way. So free, free means it's not being forced, and it's not restrained, other than to stop it falling to the ground. And that might be the first place to start. The next stage is free fixed, so it's still a free vibration. You're not forcing it. You just give it a tap and let it ring. But this might be clamped down in some way. So like a diving board is clamped at one end. But they both have natural frequencies. Those natural frequencies can be damped or undamped. And at the sort of levels we're talking about, structural da da damping, the difference between the natural frequency of damped or undamped is small. But it can make a difference. So that's the natural frequency expressed in hertz. It's the notes you hear if you play a piano. Uh, and it's also known as an eigenvalue, so the F FE refers to as an eigenvalue analysis. If we then say that frequency is interesting, what shape is it, what, which direction is it moving, we then go on to what FE would call an eigenvector analysis uh, and, and pick up the deformed shape. And some, some modal tests can pick up the deformed shape. There's only two numbers that really matter, mass and stiffness. So if you're going to get your FE model right, you need to make sure the FE model matches the mass and matches the stiffness. And it's much easier in SI than other, other units. So even if you're not going to do 
dynamic FE. Mass and stiffness and natural frequencies are a very good measure of your FE model's quality and accuracy. If we compare and contrast between analysis and test, let's, let's start with the, the FE. Here we have a, could well be a free free analysis. You can see it wobbling back and forwards and it's a very simple bending case. The maximum bending stress is down the bottom. The 101 hertz is actually the same thing with, with the phase difference between the left and right side, so you get twist. So the same frequency of excitation can give different, different uh, stress patterns. In this case, they're different frequencies as well. If we go to the next frequency, 200 hertz, you'll see it starts to bend in the middle. So that'll have a different failure location. But those are fundamental properties. There's no forcing. There may or may not be a, a restraint. Um, you could do it free-free, and that gives you some confidence in the structural behavior. Over on the right-hand side, we have the same thing for a square plate. This square plate's about a foot square. It's horizontal. The white dust is sand or salt or something like that, tiny particles. And underneath, right in the center, there's a shaker that just goes through the frequency range. And as you trigger each mode shape, you can see that the, the white trace particles show which, which shape it is. And you can compare shape and frequency. And sometimes they're even in the wrong order, so it's a it, it's really good, good way of checking for correlation. Thanks to some of my Gruel and Care colleagues here. If we start on the right, there's, there's several ways to do this. You start with a hammer, which has a, a force transducer on it, so it, trigger, it knows when you hit, hit the structure. And you're just tapping it very gently, just enough to make it ring. And you can either tap it in one place and make measurements in lots of places with multiple accelerometers, or you can put one accelerometer on and then walk around the structure and tap it in different locations. Either way, you get the transform function, and you can pick up the mode shapes and the natural frequencies if you've put them in the right place. If the structure is large, and I'll give an example one in, in due course, uh, a small tap with the hammer might not be good enough, so you have what's known as a modal exciter. And it, it looks like this. It's about the size of a rugby ball. It hangs from wires, so it's suspended freely. This looks like a framework of a, an aluminium space frame for a car. And this, this thing excites back and forwards. If you look very closely, you can see a, a very fine line, the wire there. The wires attach to the structure. So it's very stiff in the axial direction. And if you move it to one side, it's very flexible. So it very precisely triggers the, the forcing direction you want. So you end up with a transfer function that gives you natural frequencies and mode shapes. Modal, modal analysis tells you what might happen, but it doesn't tell you how, how long the fatigue life will be, because fatigue depends on amplitude. So the next question we have to ask ourselves is how much does the structure vibrate? As always with statics, it depends on the magnitude of the force applied. It depends on the location and direction of the force. And that's why this, this device is useful, because it, it controls the direction. With a hammer, you can tap it vertically, horizontally, laterally, carefully. Um, the, the exciter is a, a more precise way of doing it. So it depends on location and direction, and it also depends on the applied frequency, and that's, that's new information. And that's known as a frequency response function. It shows how the frequency, th through the frequency range, how the response varies, and it's measured as a ratio of output over input. And it depends on damping. I'll show you that in a moment, but damping is, is very important in, in fatigue. So just as a simple example, the first two modes might be 10 hertz and 20 hertz, 10 hertz responds to a vertical excitation, 20 hertz responds to a lateral excitation. So if you excited at 10 hertz laterally, you may get very little response. It has to be the right direction and the right, right frequency. The fatigue loading could be transient or steady state. Uh, obviously tapping something with a hammer is, is a short transient. Steady state is driving down a bumpy road and the, and the, the uh, oscillations build up like the Kerman Arras Bridge did. Here's a simplistic representation of a single degree of freedom system. So what we have here is looks like a light, and it's got a mounting, which might be rubber bushes, et cetera, and sealants. So we have a mass, a mass on a spring, and some degree of damping. Just to give you an idea of damping in, in structural terms, it might be something like 5%, but varying it from 3% to 7% can make a huge difference on life. It can double or halve it quite easily. 
So what we have here is a, a constant frequency and we excite the structure. This is the base we're exciting over a small amplitude. And then we measure the response of the output. And that ratio, output over input, is known as the frequency response. And it varies, as you guess, with, with frequency. So if we start down at low frequency at quasi-static, the response is the same as it would be at static loads. No difference. That dynamics has no effect. Then we move up towards the first mode shape, and it resonates. And the resonance gives you two things. One is the peak, and if you have no damping, then you'll get infinite response. That's okay with a modal test because you're not forcing it. But if, if you are forcing something and don't put damping in, you'll get a silly result. The other thing we can measure is, is the width of this peak. The wider it is, the more damping is present. And, and occasionally you get a slight shift in the natural frequency as well between damped and undamped. So that's the first peak we're looking for, and that can be crucial. There'll be a few more of those. As the frequency carries on upwards, it gets to a point where it's the same as static. That's sort of a coincidence. And if you push it fast enough, it'll, it'll respond not at all. So simply imagine you've got a ship and an engraving tool. If you engrave something like the name of the ship on the side of it, the ship is hardly going to respond. It's just, just local response. So that's an FRF, frequency response function. It tells us the amplitude of response with respect to frequency and, and for different levels of damping. Then we come to shaking things, and there's, there's two types. I'll, I'll show you another little video, and then I'll come back to, to this one. This is the Saturn V rocket, and it's the, the rocket's here, this, this big white column you can hardly see, and it's on a floor below, and it goes up through several floors. And this is the team of technicians who are going to do a frequency response function, or at least check for mode shapes. This technology isn't the highest, but it's very, very visible. There they are, they're all lying on their back, pushing. Someone else on the other side is pulling on a rope. And little by little, this, this huge, great rocket starts to wobble and they can measure the natural frequency which obviously they want to know about on takeoff because they don't want it bumping into the tower so that is its simplicity is how to find the natural frequency for big structure it's quite important to distinguish between a frequency response function and a, a structural test they weren't going to do any damage to the rocket. They were just trying to find out its physics, what is its natural frequency in which direction. At the other end of the scale, you can actually put something on a, a structure on test. This blue box is a box of electronics. This is a slip table, so it can slide back and forwards, and it's driven by this thing, which is the best part of a metre long, as you can see from the size of the people, and, and an awful lot of cooling required because it's, it's high power. So you can shake it very hard and actually do some structural damage, and that's part of a, a shaker table test. But the, the frequency response is, a, a, by comparison, a delicate process just to find the natural frequencies. So we've, we've talked about quasi-static, which is the stuff we've been doing fatigue with for years. We've talked about dynamics, mode shapes, and frequency response functions. So now we're going to look at the, the different types of fatigue loading, and how they're applied in design life. We'll start with transient. So we go back to the same as the quasi-static. We've got time domains such as RPC test rigs. So this frequency signal contains frequency content just like before. The difference is that before we said, I think this is a quasi-static structure and ran static FE, so that's that. On this occasion, we're now going to include dynamics in the, in the FE model as well. We'll also do random PST and sign sweep, etc. We'll come back to that. So transient loading. You can do a full nonlinear transient dynamic, and it's relatively easy to feed into design life. Uh, a lot of people, though, still like to use modal because it's a more efficient solution. So now we're looking at this. Mass times acceleration, we've got the mass right. Displacement times stiffness, so that gets the mode shapes going. And our friend CX dots damping. If you don't know the damping, then you're guessing the results. And obviously, it's now a function of time. So in the quasi-static case, we put a load case on, let's say load case one, and had how, how load one varies with time. Then we'd have load two, a lateral load, how load two varies with time, and we'd add them together with superposition. 
Modal superposition of the dynamic model is exactly the same. We start by running the FE with a modal stress, so it knows what the stresses are per mode. That's, that's a, a solution step beyond a normal modal analysis. And then we feed in the loading histories. So what were X, Y, Z, whatever they might be, load versus time? We feed them in, and the FE model recognizes the frequency content in them and says, ah, load case one is going to trigger mode one, load case two might trigger mode two. So one's bending, one's tension. And it doesn't just trigger them once, it triggers them through time. So this could be a busy, busy mode at first and then go quiet. This could be a quiet mode and become busy. But it's linear elastic stresses, so we use superposition. The only difference is in this case, we have one load case and two modes. We might have three load cases and 23 modes. The output is still stress versus time, and we know what to do with that. So there's a little bit of effort to take take these loads, put them into a format that NASTRA and ANSYS Abacus recognize, and then the solver gives you back the modal stresses, which is the stress for each mode in these in unit terms, and the modal coordinates. And these are the modal coordinates. This is how much to scale that mode by. So it's just like a load scaling factor. So doing sort of steps. First of all, we define the, mo the FE model and validate the modes. That's really important. Uh, we then have to take a forcing function versus time and convert to uh, the FE input table. That could be multi-body dynamics or measured. It doesn't matter which. And there's a, a glyph that does that conversion for you. The FE combines the modal results, the damping, which is absolutely vital, and the force time inputs and outputs, stress per mode, mode versus time, known as modal participation factors or contribution factors. And if you multiply those together, you get stress per mode, mode per time, stress time, which then makes us feel at home. Design life just combines things as usual. Uh, in fact, it's so, so close to the, the norm, it doesn't even need a different license. So when would you use it? Short transients is the obvious one. You might have to use it for long transients if, if you have no other choice. Uh, and the obvious one is you use it when FFTs are not valid. So you can't use the PSD approach and you have to stay in the time domain. So there's, there's an example where we need to. So this is what it looks like. The FE has sent us stress load cases. In this case, it's mode shapes. The modal coordinate input has come from the FE. That, that tells us how the modes vary with time. And we just convert them into time series lookalikes. Uh, the, the odd thing is this is 10 modes and 10 modes here, but the original load case might have been three. That's the, the number of load cases and number of modes is, is not connected. So if we whiz through the mode shapes, you can see there's some high stresses where the bolt is attached in a hinge, more general. So depending on which mode shape you trigger, if you change the frequency but keep the amplitude, you'll trigger different modes and therefore damage in different locations. So three input loads, load versus time, and those, those become as many modes as you choose. And if you look at the scaling of this, these scalings are 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 6, decimal places, point, point 0.2, point 0.3. So we can see very rapidly that actually it's only the first couple of mode shapes that cause any significant damage. And that's useful if you're going to run a test rig, because you won't be trying to re re reproduce kilohertz, you just re reproduce the frequencies that matter. And it may also help you understand the structure and therefore choose a solution if the life is too short. So that's the transient, which is close to home. And then now we make the step into frequency domain loading. What's a PST? The PSTs describe the load. They don't need or guarantee structural response. So if you see a PSD, it doesn't mean there's a structural dynamics case. It means that the loading has been defined in terms of frequency. It's often used to describe random loading where rare events exist. So if you had a once in a hundred year wave and a transient, you'd have to analyze a hundred years just to include that one bump at the end, the big wave. And that, that would be very inefficient. So what you can do in the PSD is say there is a big event, but it happens 0.1% of the time. So PSDs are used to describe random loadings. Um, we also have frequency response type, uh, frequency domain loading like swept sign, et cetera, as well. But PSD is a popular one. Um, it's often used to simulate shaker table tests. 
Now there's questions whether there's the shaker table test is completely valid, but if you've got to get through the test, this is a useful analysis to do. So you, the, the requirement to make sure a PSD is valid, because it's based on FFT theory, still stands. But it's certainly a common case that we have to simulate the shaker test. For those who've forgotten what Fourier transforms are or what FFTs are, we have on, on the y-axis amplitude, on the x-axis time domain, and behind it the frequency domain. And here we have a signal that looks quite sort of typical, it's ups and downs, bumps. And it's actually built of nothing but sine waves, pure sine waves. And if you add them together in the right ratios, you get to a, something like an approximating square wave. So you can do what you like. Frequency here are one hertz, three hertz, five hertz, nine hertz. And you, they're all present, the only question is what's the amplitude? So that's, that's what a Fourier transform does. It takes what was a time domain signal that we understand and turns it into the frequency domain. On shaker table test rigs and on in design life, you'll find there's things like standard time histories, which give you a narrow band, uh, single, single sign tone, just one frequency. A narrow band, which is if you look all oh, much the same frequency with a little bit of variation. And there is a mathematical difference between these, don't, don't mix them up. Broadband has lots of frequencies in it. And sometimes you talk about white, white noise. Now, white noise goes from zero to infinity, so it's not entirely useful. But a version of that is pink noise, where you filter it. So white noise basically means all frequencies are equally represented, and usually in the test circumstances, uh, referred to by defining as pink noise. So an FFT is a Fourier transform, fast Fourier transform, because it's powers of two. And it's a way of converting between time and frequency domain. So you can take the time domain, you can make a PSD, and you can go the inverse fu function from PSD back to time. Now, most people can't, and that's because they take this part, the amplitude, but not the phase. So they've got the real, but not the imaginary. But if you've got both parts, real and imaginary, then you can convert back and forwards at will. So that tells us that, that this contains the same information as this. So what is it? It was created by electronics engineers who are interested in circuits and noise, and therefore the concept of power. They wanted to characterize it as a function of frequency. So that's where it came from originally. There's this, this bit which we have to remind you of for health and safety reasons, Gaussian, random, ergodic, and stationary. You must meet those criteria. Otherwise, technically, you shouldn't be using an FFT. So the question is, is that signal on the left going to meet all those four criteria? Of course, people do make approximations and simplifying assumptions. Usually what you spot them by is some strange units such as g squared per hertz. So it's, it's technically engineering units squared per hertz. So it's, it's versus frequency, but the y-axis varies. The first thing that's worth knowing is that the square root of the area under the PSD, so that's this bit, is the RMS of the time series. So if you increase the amplitude of one, it would appear here. It's worth pointing out though that the same RMS does not guarantee the same damage. We sometimes have specified tests based on analysis with these profiles, PSDs, and someone says, can you give me the RMS? I just want to test the RMS. The problem with that is that if you have two time signals much the same as each other, one just a bit bigger, and they both have the same RMS, that's fine. But the one with the lower amplitude wouldn't have the same RMS unless you bolster it with a few extras. So if you take two signals that look the same, one slightly smaller than the other, and add some peaks, then the PST will have the same RMS, or the, the time signal, I should say, should always have the same RMS. But because those extra peaks are doing more damage, the same RMS doesn't necessarily give the same damage. You need to look at the frequency content. And the reason is, is this. At low frequencies, a small acceleration will achieve a large displacement because you give it time to achieve velocity to achieve displacement. Whereas at high frequency, the signal only has a very short time to accelerate achieve a small velocity before it has to come back again. So although these peaks may have the same g squared per hertz, the high frequency ones don't achieve such large displacements. So why are they often g squared per hertz? And the answer is very simple, because people who measure things in vibration often measure them in g. It would be, could easily, equally well be in meters per second squared. So it would be meters per second squared, squared per hertz. So g is not magic, 
So what is it? If you think back to that Apollo rocket taking off, there's two lots of G at, at play. One is the vibration of things shaking, and that, that would be a fatigue problem. And the other is the natural requirement to get into outer space. You need you need to beat gravity. So it's acceleration. So here's a simple case of a roller coaster running very smoothly. Accelerates up to maximum velocity, goes through the dip, you pull maximum G, starts to slow down, goes to the top of the crest, negative G, you're floating in your seat and back to zero. So that's measuring G, but there's no sign of vibration there. It's a very smooth quasi-static response. And then we come to put it all together. You can see our friend the shaker table in the background. So we have a structure here which understands the frequency response. We have an FE model the same. We'd have done it with a, a, a small amplitude swept sign to find the frequency response. We've now replaced that with the PSD that we want to excite it with. Notice you have to usually stop when you get close to zero because it becomes quasi-static. Typically, typical shape of trapezoidal form and it trails off at higher frequencies. So th this is describing how much amplitude to apl apply to the rig at different frequencies. And you could put a strain gauge on it or an accelerometer and measure it in the time domain. So we actually get the time domain back out if you want to measure it. And if we take a PSD of it, we'll get a PSD where the strain gauge is attached of the response. So that's the stress response effectively. And in design life, we do much the same. We apply the PSD. This has the frequency response function it, so it knows the modes and it knows knows the amplitude of each each mode shape response. And it gives us pretty plots as usual. But there's something something happening slightly differently here because we don't have a we don't have a time domain going in, so we can't do a conventional rainflow count. So that's when we turn to methods such as Derlich or Lalan, which will give us an equivalent rainflow count. It will effectively produce matrix like this one in the top in the top right corner, rainflow matrix from a PSD rather than from the time domain. One of the reasons we have to do this is a, a common assumption in narrowband is that for every time you go positive through the through the zero, there's a peak and you come back down again. So if, if we assume that for this cycle, we'd have two peaks, this one and this one. But clearly they're almost one and the same. There's only a small dip. So a narrowband assumption wouldn't wouldn't be valid. And that's why we've come to Derlich and Lan. And what they do is they basically take moments, they take a strip at a given frequency, and they take moments about the y-axis. And that's how they calculate the range flow content. So in design life, we put a PSD in. We have a component frequency response function, which we get from a harmonic response in FE packages. That gives us the local response, which looks like this. At every node, there's effectively output a PSD, and we want to take the area under the curve. So we've now got cycles. This is a 2D matrix. We've, we've ignored the mean stress in this case. So we can see small cycles, lots of them, trailing off to apparently zero, and then the corresponding damage. And it's interesting to note that when there's no cycles, there's some damage. That's because this is a, a log effect, and it's a linear scale. Um, there are actually very small numbers of very big cycles. And in particular, if this represented one hour and some event happens every 10 hours, then the number of cycles here would be 0.1. So that's why we use matrices in this case, which we don't use for the rest of design life. And that's it. It's all, it's all quite straightforward. The challenge is, can you make a model that corresponds and gives good mode shapes and agrees? And then the final bit in, in, the, in the test is having done all the calculations and the mathematics, if you assume fatigue properties for the material, you'll be disappointed. You need Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio to start with. For gravity loads or dynamics, we need density. You might need a stress drain curve if you think it's going elastoplastic. You might need orthotropic properties if it's composite. And they're all obtained from static tests. And they tend to be readily available because they're cheap to do and suppliers are happy to provide them. What's much more difficult is fatigue calculations from FE and strain gauges. You need a stress life or strain life curve and they're obtained from cyclic tests. Now, these tests are quasi-static. We're not doing high-frequency tests. They might be 20, 30 hertz at most. How many cycles do you need? Well, for some specimens, we may, might need 100 or 1,000 cycles, but others, we need millions, and those tests take time. So if you, if you haven't got materials data, plan ahead. And 
before, in case I didn't make it clear, please remember you need damping. Otherwise, your entire calculation is guesswork. If you'd like to know about, more about materials testing, please visit our lab. We'd be delighted to welcome you back as soon as it's possible. So in summary, vibration builds on fatigue as we, as we know it in existing processes. Things such as boundary conditions, thicknesses, joints, they all, all come the same. The key issue is, does loading, ex the loading frequency excite the natural frequency of the structure? If they do, you've got to include it. If they're separate by a good, good margin, then you don't need to worry. You still need materials data, which used to be the thing we would remind you about regularly as, as the final step that was missing. Uh, and now with frequency domain, we need damping as well. So it's up to you to make simplifying assumptions. It's still possible to assume things are quasi-static to start with, um, but uh, you have to justify those assumptions.